Good morning, everyone. And uh, to all our special children, I should say, Aloha Islanders. Aloha, that's right. Well, we've had, okay, shh. We've had a lot of that this week. And we've also had a lot of fun. And this is our Vacation Bible School Week where we have uh, had all these kids on Mystery Island where we have been tracking down the truth about the one true God. And so you can see here in Buccaneer Bay, we have all sorts of exciting things going on where we've traveled to everywhere from Chameleon Cove on day one all the way to McCall Mountain on our final day of Vacation Bible School. And if you haven't had a chance to walk around and see how this place is transformed, then please, please take an opportunity. We've tried uh, to transform this entire place so the kids can be immersed in this experience so they truly can look to the Bible, experience things all around them and in real life ways to find out truths and, so, and to solidify those truths from the Word of God as they go around, as we playfully say, Mystery Island. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I've always dreamed about preaching in front of a pirate ship. And today, I get my chance. Aren't you jealous? I know you are. I know you are. So, we'll open with a word of prayer. We'll have a couple of songs and uh, some Bible reading today as well. And uh, we'll have some special things from the kids as we go through our service. So, let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are our great and almighty and wonderful God. We're thankful for your truth that you've shared with us through your word. And I pray, Father, for each of these children, Lord, that they would continue to grow closer to you, that they would continue to learn more about you, and that they would use their lives in service to you. Father, I pray for all of us here today that we would be encouraged by the zeal of these children, that we would be uplifted by your Holy Spirit, and we would be challenged by your word. And above all things, Father, we ask that you would be glorified during this service today and in every aspect of our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please stand with me and turn in your hymn book to page 221. Brother Barry will lead us. Page 221, 221. We're going to sing, all sing the first and last verse. First and last verse. Hmm, hold on just a second. <laughs> But I'm going to sing the verse on the second verse and the third verse, and then everybody come in on the chorus. All right. Page 221, A Child of the King. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of and diamonds of silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the King, child of the King, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. I'll sing. You come in on the chorus. Listen to the words of the song. Put yourself in the place of the songwriter. You're that person. My father's own son, the savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now he is pleading our pardon on high that we may be his when he comes by and by. Everybody, I'm a child of the king, a child of the king, with Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the king. Listen, I once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. 
But I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. Sing, I'm a child of the king, of the king, with Jesus my savior. A child of the king. On the last, everybody, a tent for a cottage. Why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing. Oh, glory to God. I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King. A child of the King. With Jesus, my Savior. I'm a child of the King. Takes me a minute to get back from Chameleon Cave over there, so pardon the uh, the slight pauses. Uh, you can all be seated. Our Bible reading today is going to come from Psalm 34. Our reading from the Psalms will come from Psalm 34. Well, we'll start in verse 11, and the Bible says here, and this chapter is the heart of what we're doing here for Vacation Bible School. Psalm 34 and verse 11 says this, Come, ye children, hearken, or listen, unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life, and loveth many days, that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, and do good. Seek peace, and and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Throughout this week, we've tried to take the verses of Scripture and pair them with real life. But from the perspective of a child, you know, they have challenges to their faith, just like adults. They have probing questions about God, just like adults. They have questions that need answers about their faith, just like adults. But they don't think like adults yet. That's not a criticism. That's a reality. So as ministers, as people of God who desire to see our children nurtured and admonished in the Lord, whether as parents or as a body of believers together, we want to come together to help them, according to their age and stage in life, to find the truth of God's Word and make it real in their life. And the psalmist here says it succinctly, Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And that's exactly what we've tried to do. And while the psalmist goes on to explain many lessons that he would love for these children to learn, we've come through every day, five days now, to teach them in, uh, succinctly what verse number 22 encapsulates. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Now, I know as we look around with adult eyes, perhaps we would say like Paul, well, when I was a child, I thought as a child. Child, and I spoke as a child, but <clears throat> I have put away childish things. And we all know, parents, that at a certain point we, we must. As adults, we do put away childish things, and it's time to grow up. As I heard one person say, what was the silliest thing you wished for when you were a kid? And they said, to be an adult. 
Because it's hard, isn't it? You know what? You know what's really hard? Being an adult without God. Hello? And if we can teach children in the young, supple years of their youth, where they can still be guided as a tender plant, not as a hardened tree trunk, as we can teach them to bear fruit, then we'll only have to prune them as they get older, not have to uproot and replant. And so we ask these children to hearken unto us, to learn the fear of the Lord, to learn who God is and why he's the ruler and how he's almighty and just how real his power can be in their life because it is amazing what God does when his children, <clears throat> that's all of us, put our trust in him. And so when you sing like you just did, I'm a child of the king, remember, you can sit here and learn a lot from the faith of a child the innocence of a, of a child, the joy and exuberance of a child that they have by simply learning cool things about God from their perspective. It's life-changing. And I hope that you will pray that these children will continue to grow in their faith, that they'll be strengthened and matured in their understanding of God, but that they will draw close to Him, that they will never draw back from Him, and that they will know Him and not just know cool stuff about Him. And I know that's your prayer for your children. Will you make it the prayer for every one of these children that are here seated on these front rows? I hope that you do. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can be here and that we can be encouraged by your word and that we can be challenged to make these children a priority in our life and in the life of our ministry. God, help us to be faithful, to teach them to trust in you and to teach them the fear of the Lord. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand with me and turn in your hymn book to page 173, a kid's favorite, and I hope one of yours, Love Lifted Me. Come on, brother. Nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will away. He is Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. A love lifted me, a love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Some of y'all figured it out at the end. I had to get your calf workout in, do those calf raises there. All right. Well, our kids, you can be seated. Uh, the kids are going to come at this time, and they're going to have some special music that they learned during VBS, and, and they're going to come. And that's your cue to stand up, children, and come on over. And they're going to sing, What a Mighty God We Serve.
All right, at this time, we're gonna have a uh, real quick certificate presentation for uh, all of those that are able to be with us here today. And so if I could get a little help, that way we can uh, uh, go through this as, as quickly as we possibly can. These campers all helped uh, find the treasure, the treasure of tracking down the one true God. And some of them aren't here. We had 38 kids um, all come through here throughout this week, and, and some were able to join us today, others were not. And so if you're here, uh, pop up and run up here as quickly as you can. And if not, then uh, just look at me strangely as you normally do, and uh, we'll get, the, uh, we'll get the, the hint. All right, Jackson Cummings. I don't think Jackson's here today. Paisley's not here. All right, Maya Morero. Let's get the whole family, Ivana and Samuel as well. And Faith, why don't you just come on down with them too? All right. I'll give those to you, and you'll come see Miss Carissa. Amelia and Elicia Martin. I know they're here. Amelia and Elicia. Let's see. Daniel, David, and Eli. Come on down. Give me a little, give me a little prices right here. <laughs> Thank you. I can spot the people in my age demographic. Thank you. All right. Adrian. Where'd you go? Oh, there you are, way down there. Come on up, buddy. He's had an exciting week. He's been at camp and vacation Bible school. All right, Gabriel Bledsoe. Your brother's back a little further. Don't worry, we, we didn't forget Elliot. Millie. Here we go. And Champ. Chris, I'll give you Gabriel's for you. Anthony. Is Anthony here? Oh, he's in nursery. Well, that's appropriate. Olivia. Olivia Pelk. There, there she is. She's hiding. Let's see. Abe Ottaway. He's in the nursery. This is the nursery class. There you go. Elliot. Where's Elliot? There he is. All right. These guys aren't here. Is Amelia Goodwill here? Amelia? Amelia? There, there she is. She was hiding behind someone. Come on down, honey. Anastasia. Charlotte came. She's sick today. Jaden. Avery Ottaway. Oh, she's so excited. All right, and that does it. Give these Islanders a round of applause, please. All right, this week we have had something very special going on, and we are going to continue that today, and it's something that we call the Penny Wars. All right, and this is where we look for an excuse to put a pie in someone's face. Which today, that pie could either go in my face. No, 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 no. Or Miss Lisa's face. Yes, yes. And so... Oh, me. Oh, we're getting we're getting aggressive here today in the in the Lord's house. Well, today we've decided we had an offering yesterday and we're going to make it a super offering. And we're even giving parents and adults an opportunity to chip in if you want to help out. Now, uh, I do have on an anonymous source that any donation made to the boys will be doubled. OK, uh, 
No, that's not true. I, I don't think I could afford to put that much in. But uh, adults, if you would like to uh, put some cash in the bucket, someone once told me, uh, if you're going to be a good Baptist pastor, don't pass a plate, pass a bucket. So we have buckets uh, to put some things in. That is a joke, okay? Um, you know, I'm not preaching on tithing today. But if you do want to help out the kids, if you want to do something cute and slip them some money so that way they can put it in, as they get released here in just a couple of minutes, um, they will put in their money. Money if they brought any pennies or coins or dollars and put them in there and then the team with the most wins and the losing team um, has to which will probably be the boys sorry uh, has to you know see me get a pie in the face by my lovely wife who has been looking forward to this all week all week okay so um, let me see guys if we could um, uh, let's see I got my buckets right down here so if I could get some of my helpers here from BBS to come uh, grab the buckets and what the kids do and I don't want anyone to feel awkward they on their way out just drop the money into uh, the bucket uh, no we don't need that just yet uh, we can just stand right over here and the kids will come through and teachers you can lead them back to the fellowship hall on their way out and um, and they'll drop any offering they have in and adults uh, if as my helpers are on the way out you want to flag them down or you want to give an offering to the little kids uh, then that would be super super encouraging for them and uh, here we go. All right, kids. So if you have an offering, boys, put it in the boy bucket. Girls, put it in the boy bucket. And everything will be just fine. Girls, girls, that's the wrong, bu that's the wrong bucket. Wrong bucket, girls. What's going on? It's anarchy in the house of God. And when you're done, just dump the girl's bucket. Whoa, whoa. No, once it's in, it's done. You can't take it out. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. You know, I have to say the offering never lasted this long any other day of the week. to cut this off at some point i feel like moses up here like look you brought enough people you brought enough take your beaver skin and your badger's hair and go somewhere else all right i think that's it so good job and good job you parents for enabling your children to ruin the pastor's face that's wonderful i think i am actually buddy i think i am there you go give me five I am. All right, kiddos. Time to go to the rest of your day. Getting on like that, it'll be all right. All right. Well, hey, if you can't have fun in church, where can you have fun? I mean, really. So if you want to see more fun, I'll be following up my dramatic pie in the face, which I'm sure is inevitable at this point, with uh, giving you a shot to knock me in the dunking booth. Some of those kids got me, and if they didn't get me, they cheated, and they came and ran up and hit the little, uh, hit the little thing, so they'll, uh, they'll get what's coming to them because I have, I'm equipped with a hose, and I squirt kids profusely. All right. Now the rest of us can turn to Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. Acts chapter number 13 
It's funny, I grew accustomed to the noise, and now I'm like, is, is anyone out there? I don't hear anyone turning in their Bibles. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. The message this morning is the heart of what we've been trying to teach to the children, what we try to teach to every adult, that they would know the Lord and that they would understand that the gospel is sent to you, to you individually. And here in Acts chapter 13, we'll read verse 26 to start off with, and we'll read several other verses as we go. But we'll begin in verse number 26 of Acts chapter 13, where the Bible says here, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. The message this morning is entitled, The Gospel is Sent to You. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. For your word and your grace, we thank you for the truth of salvation. We, thank, we are thankful that you're trustworthy, that you're able to save, and Lord, that you're willing to save us. God, I pray that you'll give us wisdom, help us to have insight, help us to know the gospel. We pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most important legal documents that you could ever possess is the last will and testament. Now, we've had ours for several years now, and, and maybe some of you have a last will, maybe even a living will, but a last will and testament is your last opportunity to facilitate arguments among your family. No, 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 not just that, but it's a last opportunity to, to really say what you want to do with your earthly possessions. Now, one man happened to realize this at an extremely inconvenient time while he was dying. And this Englishman was there lying on his bed, and the only thing that he had nearby, I have no idea how this came to be about, but he wrote his last will on an empty eggshell. An eggshell. You heard that correctly. And you know what? It was legal. It was legitimized. They recognized that in the court of law, and it simply said to Mag, everything I possess, JB. Keep in mind, it's an eggshell. Probably don't have a lot of space, even if it was one of the large eggs that you could find. And we've seen that wills have been written on leather, old pictures, shells, cloth, pieces of the furniture, stone and glass. In fact, I know one man that uh, was getting ready to board a plane and willed, uh, wrote down his will for his children in case he got in a plane accident. He wrote it down on a drink napkin and signed it. And we know that even, uh, no matter what we write it on, it's important to have a will that is written and it's witnessed, duly witnessed. And that is what we have before us. If you're holding a Bible, you have a will and testament right there in your hands. It's been written and it's been duly witnessed that this is true. And this truth has come to us today through the book of Acts that we hold here in our hands and that we examine and we see in accordance with verse number 26 that this word of salvation has been written and it's been witnessed that we have it and it's given to you and to me. We have it here with us. And just as family members would gather around to hear the reading of their loved one's will and testament, we can hear God's will for us and his everlasting testament that he wants to have a relationship with us. So what is this word of salvation? If you'll look back in Acts chapter 13, and you'll look at verse number 23, you'll see that the Bible says this, Of this man's seed hath God, according to the promise, to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. This word that came to Israel is according to the promise of God. Over 350 promises prophesied about Jesus Christ, every one of them fulfilled in his first coming. There are more promises that remain, but over 350 fulfilled already. God, according to his promise, raised up in Israel a Savior, Jesus Christ by name. This anointed one, the one that was chosen, the one that was selected, 
selected the one that would save his people from their sins. And this word which was promised is that of forgiveness. This forgiveness is granted to anyone who will exhibit repentance of sin, that is a godly sorrow, a desire to turn away from their sins because they realize the pain and anguish that has that their broken uh, that their sin has caused when they break God's word. And it says here, if you look in the same chapter, verses 38 and 39, that repentance and faith are brought together. The Bible says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And you would think, of course, at the most rudimentary level, we understand that everyone who is saved is saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we also understand, interestingly enough, if we were to dig into the details of the Mosaic law, that there were many provisions for sins to be forgiven through through an animal sacrifice and ritual. But you know, there's something mentioned in the Bible by David about a great transgression. And he identifies that great transgression in the Psalms as presumptuous sins. You know what I found interesting? That as you read through the book of Leviticus, you know, the one where you get sleepy all the time as you're making your annual trek through the Bible, and you come across Levi Tychus, or however you may say it, and you go, oh, oh, how long is this chapter again? 89 verses. Oh my. Yeah, that one. In that book, which captures a daily experience of your typical Jew as they would come to make sacrifice in the Levitical process, you'll You'll find in there that there's provision for lots of sins through meat offerings and blood offerings and animal offerings and, and offerings with flour and oil mingled in and all sorts of things. But you know, of all the sins that could be explained in the book of Leviticus, there's one, interestingly enough, that's not covered, the presumptuous sin. If you're sitting there wondering what a presumptuous sin is, it's the sin that you do on purpose without caring. You do it simply because you want to. Oh, you know better. You've been taught better. You've been raised better. You've heard better. Whether it's in Leviticus with the reading of the Mosaic Law as prophets and priests and scribes would stand up throughout the history of Israel to describe what it is that God desired for his people. You can read through the law and you will find no sacrificial provision for a presumptuous sin. So there is something not covered by the law of Moses, the sin where you know better but just don't care. Is there any greater example of enmity against God, of being God's enemy, of raising your fists the way that the world does in total abject rebellion against him? And if you look through the Gospel of John, the word world is used interestingly. It's used in such a way not to just encompass a, a total population. It's not the concept of just every single person on there, but it's really a word that characterizes a group of people, not just numbers a group of people. And the character of that people could be brought down to just one word, rebels. People who rebelled against God, people who heard his word, who saw what the right way was, understood that Jesus was bearing witness of the Father, that he always did that which was right and pleasing, that surely God must be with him for him to do all these miracles. And as Jesus explained to Nicodemus, God sent his son, his only begotten son, into the world that all the world through him might be saved if they believed because God so loved the world, or we could also say God loved those rebels despite their rebellion. Paul would come along and, and an echo of this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 sa would say this, that Christ or God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
We were yet sinners. We were yet rebels. According to Ephesians 2, we were at enmity with God. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that spirit that was within us to raise our fist against God. That same God loved us with the great love, the great love wherewith he loved us, still sent Jesus Christ to die for us that we might be saved by his amazing grace. This grace is offered to us in the face of Jesus Christ. This word of salvation is sent to you and to me. And this salvation, amazingly, also in John, was also defined by Jesus Christ himself. John chapter 17, Jesus explained what salvation was. It's to know the Father. That as he prayed in that garden of Gethsemane, after teaching the disciples that final lesson before his betrayal, he said that this is salvation, that they might know you, speaking to the Father, and believe on him whom thou hast sent. He wants you to know God. He wants you to know that God is trustworthy, that he is who he says he is, and that he loves you. In fact, it's, it could be easy to say that this good news is that the whole Trinity is involved in your salvation. They want you in their totality to know that you are saved, that you are forgiven, that God himself is on a mission of mercy, that Jesus Christ is willing to die for every single person to rescue us from the cost of our sins and that the Holy Spirit himself is sent to help us understand judgment and righteousness and belief that we would believe on Jesus Christ, that we would see that the prince of this world is judged and that we would know what righteousness really is and that through Jesus Christ, we too can be righteous. The simple truth is that Jesus came to live the life that you couldn't died the death that he shouldn't in order to take the punishment that you wouldn't. That is our God. He came as a substitute for you and for me. He took our place to receive God's wrath for our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's an interesting story about President Lincoln many years ago, of course, as he was examining his life in light of the war that he was, of course, known for. And as he reflected on the soldiers that were given their life by the hundreds, he reflected on how one of those surely took his place. That had he not been the president, he too would have become a soldier. That he too could have died on a battlefield somewhere if he had not been the president. And in fact, he took this so seriously, this thought sobered him so greatly that in Pennsylvania, there is today a unique grave of a Civil War soldier. And that grave bears a stone with the birth and the death uh, uh, dates where uh, for Abraham Lincoln. And there's a statue that says, Abraham Lincoln's substitute. Because in great woe and anguish, the president, realizing that thousands upon thousands were falling in his place, wanted to do something to honor one particular soldier as his substitute and made him a symbol. You see, upon great reflection, we admire those who would be our substitute. And while we love our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and Coast Guardsmen, we understand that as they have substituted for many of us, there's one, there's one who has substituted for all of us. Jesus Christ is that great eternal substitute that gave his life that we all might live instead so we could live eternally with God. Having been made sins for us, we can become the righteousness of God in him. And because he lives, the word of salvation is sent to you. Now, how is it sent to you? It's sent in that general and great commission which ordains that it is preached. And if you are here, it is being sent to you today through the preaching of this word. And in fact, we are commissioned as a church to preach this word of salvation to every single creature. In the providence of God that has led you into the audience today, you are here to hear this word of salvation preached 
relates to you. And in particular, every single person, whether it's in your particular case or according to your character or by necessity, a specific prescription is written for you by the great physician, Jesus Christ himself, to identify and heal and cure that sinful disease that plagues us all. It's meant for you. Could you imagine how sad it would be if we had to go around and look at people individually and say, it's not sent to you. It's not sent to you, but it's sent to you. It's not sent to you, but it's sent to you. Sad that would be. Sad. The word of salvation is sent to you, to me, to everyone. And that is our mission. There's an interesting story about a pastor who was speaking with a woman who after a, uh, a, a service, she was looking for some spiritual guidance. And so she came to the pastor after the service had concluded and she desired to know Christ as her savior, but she, she wasn't quite sure about a few things. And so the pastor wanted to help her out. And throughout the course of their discussion, he happened to ask her a question. Do you, do you happen to know any scripture? Is there any Bible verse that you might've memorized or that you remember from childhood? And she says, yeah, actually I, I do remember John three sixteen as I'm sure many of us do. And he said, well, would you mind quoting it for me? And uh, he's looking for that nice place to jump off and help explain. And so, of course, she says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, some of you have picked up on the fact that she did indeed say forgotten son. Now, the pastor, being wise and discerning, said, well, do you know why he is the forgotten son? And she said, no, I, I don't. He says, so he could remember you. So he could know you, remember you. Because there was a time on that cross where Jesus Christ called out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Forgotten, the only forgotten son. And those of us who have been placed into Jesus Christ, immersed into him by receiving the gift of grace by faith, according to Romans 5, we are forgotten in Adam, but we are loved and remembered in Jesus Christ. He's been sent to remember you forever. And that pastor led her to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it reminds us that God doesn't want anybody left behind. So what position does that put us in today? Well, we understand that the word of salvation is sent to you and to me, sent this word to all sinners everywhere to hear it. And it's the word that suits every sinner in every situation, whether it's a, a, a situation where they feel condemned and they need pardon. Everyone that's condemned could say this word is sent to me. Everyone that needs a word of peace that word is sent to every rebel. Every, this word is sent, uh, this word of life is sent to those who are dead in trespasses and sins. The word that's sent is a word of liberty to the captives who are held prisoner by sin. It's a word of healing for those who have been sickened by sin. It's a word of cleansing for those who have been polluted by sin. It's a word of direction for those who are lost in sin. It's a word of refreshment. <laughs> For those who are weary and heavy laden because of sin, it's a word of comfort for the unsatisfied. It's a word of drawing and strengthening for those who are destitute of strength. It's a word of salvation, a salvation of all sorts, because Jesus Christ was sent to seek and to save that which was lost, however lost they may be. And this puts us in a unique position, one of singular favor, one where we could say, you know what? Prophets and kings and priests have died before they ever heard this. They long to hear the words of Messiah, of Jesus Christ himself, to sit at his feet, to walk in his dust, to know him the way that we can know him. 
It's a position of great hopefulness because when we put our unreserved confidence in Jesus Christ and we trust in him, we accept it. We have life and not just mediocre life. We have abundant life, life that begins anew and afresh, a life that makes us a new creature in Christ, a life that lasts forever where we can always know and experience the love and joy that God has for us. But it's also... A word that's sent to us puts us in a position of great responsibility. Because if we neglect it, how then shall we escape? In fact, the preacher of Hebrews says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? The word of salvation is the last will and testament, if you will, because it's been written and it's been witnessed and we stand on the edge of decision. I don't know if any of you have traveled to Niagara Falls, whether the Canadian or the American side, but both are absolutely spectacular as you stand there and behold the power of God revealed through thousands of gallons of Russian water. And if you've been to the American side, perhaps you've heard of one of the tours that you could go on, and it's called the Cave of Winds. It's literally under the falls. Whenever they get you ready to go on this tour, they, they adorn you with rubber suits from top to bottom. It's extremely slippery in there, as you would imagine, and they don't want anyone to slip away. And as they guide you slowly, cautiously, they're leading you under the falls to the very edge. And at this precipice, On the American side of the falls, there's 160 feet from top to bottom where thousands of gallons of water are rushing over. And you're right there on the hind side of it, watching all this water. And the mist is blinding and the sound is deafening. If you wanted to have a conversation, you're going to have to wait (laughs) because it's impossible to hear a thing with the thunderous roar. And as you think, about the water that's plunging over that side and crashing against those jagged rocks, you can know this one thing, you're safe. Because the water, the danger, is passing over you. You're passed over. Even though you are so close, you are safe from all of that because you haven't gone over the edge. But I'm afraid that there are many people that are standing on the edge of decision, that stand at the precipice and are on that edge of jagged destruction. And yet they may go over. And as we stand, and as you stand here and hearing this word of salvation sent to you, don't, don't stand on that edge and allow your life to conclude with a thunderous crashing onto the jagged rocks of God's wrath, a wrath that has already been placed where he wanted it on his son and not on you. He wants you to experience newness of life, redemption and forgiveness of sins by turning away from that wicked lifestyle, by, by having and demonstrating godly sorrow, knowing that you have, you have done something against God. Don't, don't go over the edge. Don't go over the edge. But instead, turn away from that destruction and turn back to the loving arms of Jesus Christ. Please don't leave here and basely and foolishly turn away, even delaying a response to Jesus Christ. It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Don't don't pretend your way through this decision. Don't be a phony. Don't don't act like a Christian when you've never become a Christian. Don't, Don't play the part of a temporary convert. Accept the word of salvation that's right there in front of you. Accept it. And when you do, you'll be safe from any destruction and you'll find that abundant life in which you can experience God's love day in and day out just the way he always desired. As we all stand to our feet, we'll have an opportunity to respond. Now, maybe you're in here today. And you would say, I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. You're standing on the precipice, the edge of a decision. And for reasons 
known only to you and God. You've not made that decision, but perhaps today you would make it. Now, we don't want to embarrass anyone, nor do we want to uh, harm anyone or to um, uh, pressure anyone at all. But this is an opportunity for you to respond. And as you stand there in your pew and you think about, have I become a Christian? Have I turned away from my sins? Have I placed my unreserved confidence in Jesus Christ? You say, I don't think I have. Would you come and talk to me? Sincerely, will you please come and talk to me? I want to be able to help you make a decision that will not just change your life, but will change your eternity. And if you're here today, please, please don't let the fun and the games that we're going to partake in deter you or distract you from coming to hear a saving message that will determine the rest of your life and the rest of your eternity. Please, please don't walk away from that. Now, maybe you're in here today, and as you've thought about this message, the word of God being sent to those who are in need, those who are sinners, will you pray? Will you pray for that person that the Lord has put on your heart? You say, the word of salvation has been sent to me, and I've received it, and it's for me. But I know it's sent to so many other people. God, give me grace and strength to pray for them, to send the word of God to them, I'm praying for divine appointments that God will arrange for me an opportunity to send the word of salvation to them. Will you do that? The piano is going to play a verse or two, and I ask you to pray and speak to the Lord at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of salvation that's been sent to us. We thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that this word of salvation is, is still open and available to us. And I pray, God, that you'll burden our hearts for the lost, that you'll give us grace to send this word to those who are in need. And God, as we do, we'll rely on you, the strength of your scripture and the guidance of your spirit, that we may glorify you and that there would be great rejoicing. And Lord, I thank you, especially for the children this week who have drawn closer to you, Lord, for the many, many workers. And God, I thank you for all the work that you've done here in this place. I pray that you're glorified by all that we do, and we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Now here, um, now I don't normally do this in church. I'm going to send a text to my wife to make sure that she knows uh, that we're ready because... As tempting as it is uh, for me to just end the service, uh, 
uh, without getting pied in the face, I know I would never hear the end of it. So I'm going to have some integrity. And uh, imagine that, a pastor with integrity. And uh, we're going to see... You know, that shouldn't be a joke. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're going to see. Uh, we're going to have the kids come back in here. But we'll have a couple of announcements uh, as we're waiting. Right after the service, okay, we're going to have a special carnival. We have hamburgers and hot dogs. We have plenty for everybody, okay? So please stick around. The carnival's got tons of games and prizes. And this is part two. It's a carryover from yesterday. We have inflatables and we have bounce house. And we have uh, even a dunk tank. And yours truly will be wiping the pie off his face by getting in the dunk tank and so uh, I hope you'll be there to participate uh, and we're charging an, a fee for adults and so um, you're a little bit more accurate than the kids and so uh, we'll be having a good time with that and uh, I also have been asked uh, uh, to, to mention a special prayer request. There's a young lady that attends our church, and her name is Rebecca Sandland. And uh, many of you know her, but if you don't, she has Crohn's disease. And uh, she, her Crohn's disease, uh, as, as we call it, uh, she's in the middle of a flare-up, and she's having a lot of pain, and she's been hospitalized, and she will have surgery to remove the part of her intestines that are affected by the Crohn's. Now, I don't, I don't have any more details than that. Um, I'm not sure how much will be removed, but as you can imagine, and if you know anyone with Crohn's disease, when they are flaring, it's, it's extremely painful. So please pray for Rebecca. Uh, pray for her and her pain management. Uh, pray for the doctors that they would have wisdom. Um, my wife has gone through this several times, and usually what you can see on, um, she has Crohn's in case you're not familiar with that. Uh, usually what you see on diagnostic images and what you think will be removed is not always the case when the surgeons uh, start getting involved uh, and looking at the actual um, uh, disease por portions that need to be removed. And so um, uh, no, no surgery is routine, all right? And if you've had surgery, you know that that's, that's the truth. So please pray for Rebecca. Pray for her family. Uh, pray for the shepherds as well as they minister to her. And, uh, and I would appreciate that, and they would appreciate that as well. And, um, you know, I always do this. I forgot something. Uh, oh, there's an afternoon service today. How can I forget another afternoon service? So if you, don't sh if you show up at 6 o'clock, uh, you're going to be preaching to yourself, okay, uh, because we're not having an evening service tonight. Our VBS workers have worked super hard. We've literally had dozens of people get involved um, in, in big ways and what they would think would be small ways. I don't think they're small ways because without everyone's contribution, we would not have been able to pull this off. I mean, look at all the decorating that's taken place, people pitching in, the design, the investment that's gone in, the time. People have taken vacation time. People have called in sick. People have lied to their boss. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. I don't think so. And if they did, they're smart enough not to tell me that. And um, but so much work. People have come in and said, hey, I got an hour. Let me just do what I can. And people praying, uh, contributing things, manning the booths. Uh, there's so much. There's so much. Um, even last minute things, face painting that got added because uh, people wanted to jump in and, and provide that opportunity. There's been so much, so much that people have done. And uh, even if they just showed up to get a pie in the face, you know what? We appreciate that. Uh, say, who are you talking about? Me. That's what I did. I showed up. I showed up today to get a pie in the face. I could have played sick. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Bell. There's always Adriana hasn't laughed at my jokes in a long time. I guess we're passing the baton. And so someone has to or else I get low self-esteem so um, waiting on the kids and if uh, my text message doesn't work um, can someone just go back there and get them or else I'm gonna find new things to talk about for the next 10 minutes thanks James good looking out man he's like nah nah it's already past noon I do appreciate your patience and all seriousness in case you don't have children or you're frustrated by children here's why because it's like herding cats it's hurting cats. You say, think about that. Mm -hmm. Trying to get all the cats all lined up and try to herd out there. Um, we, uh, you know, we uh, are thrilled to have the challenge of herding these cats all the way back in. So we'll have the Penny War announcement. Um, Steve, if you're out there, can you, can you, if you can hear me, why don't you come in with the buckets? And we have um, a tarp over here that we will uh, lay out real quick. And uh, someone can help out with that. That would be great. Nathan's going to help out with that. 
And so is Christine. Actually, it's probably probably a one-person job, but we'll see. And if you have a camera, now's the uh, now's the opportunity. Whoops. It's okay. Uh, um, right in the middle. Actually, you know what? Everyone wants a good view of this. Like that. That'll be good. Now. It's going to state for the record that my sermon was done long before noon. It's going to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. No one else is laughing about that. They're like, are we really just going to sit here awkwardly? Doesn't happen often, people. Enjoy it while it lasts. It must be the cave. It must be the decorations. I'm in the mood. Here the kids come. How many of you wish you were a kid again? Some of you are like, yeah, I don't know. I thought, no, I can't say that. I was going to say something snarky, but some of you don't know me that well yet. Here we go. All right, kids, come on in. You get to hear the winner of the Penny Wars. I think the boys pulled it out. I got a hundred bucks that says the boys pulled it out. Mr. Franklin has a considerable uh, sway in all of this. All right, we're going to have to, Steve, we're going to have to go with what we got or else we're going to be waiting here all day. So So if someone can help me out with my scales over here. Thank you, Ethan. Looks like Carissa. No, um someone needs to go get the pie. Kate, can you go get the pie, please? Might as well bring it right up here. And uh, I do appreciate your patience. What's that? Can't hear you. Steve has them. I've asked him to come bring them in. Let's keep telling ourselves that. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. Bar Barry and Barry are already giving me the eye, the stink eye. I'm not ready, but I might as well be. Oh, my goodness. What a break. Yeah. prayers people wow wow never in my wildest dreams i'm i'm gonna enjoy this this was worth the wait y'all thought you were I, we were stalling because i was gonna get pie but no we had to verify and verify and, ver and this is yes.
I'm going to pay for this later, but I'm going to enjoy it now. Count down. One, or three, two, one. All right. Finger looking good. I did not see that coming. I can barely see now. All right. Better get a picture of this. Truly, thank you, moms and dads, all the adults, all the workers, and everybody, everybody that contributed so much to make Vacation Bible School a success. This is the truth of preaching and talk, right? So we're very thankful for that. Let's pray. Clap, clap, clap. Snap, snap, snap. Hands together. Okay. We're gonna pray, and then don't forget, right after our barbecue and our carnival, we'll be back in here for afternoon service. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, you're so good. Thank you for giving us such joy and such love that we can experience it and share that with one another in your house. God bless us as we enjoy the rest of our day together. May you be glorified in all that's done. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Go enjoy.